one of the one of the terms is is governance that will probably come into on this panel a lot of times. So Primavera, what does what does governance mean to you, and and how do you see this work on the decentralized web? Um, well, what is governance means is kind of a difficult question, but I think it's um, like my research is about uh, the legal aspect, so like the regulation. And um, I started actually focusing a lot on blockchain technologies, and this is where I started looking at how can we actually regulate those technologies. And then, to some extent, it became kind of like obvious that we actually need to understand how the technology can actually govern itself. Right. So, if we design a particular technological artifact, um, there is there is a way to regulate it, like from the outside. But you can also try and design it in a particular manner. Right. And um, I think it's actually extremely important because there is today like a lot of focus and a lot of effort being put into designing a technical infrastructure, which is decentralized and like no point of control, etc. But there is actually still too little effort to actually understand how these technologies, this, this new infrastructure, which are decentralized, can actually be governed. Right? And, um, so my research is actually about trying to understand, on the one hand, um, so there exists like a lot of design criteria that are designed, like that are backed into the system, and this is about having something that is secure, that is resilient against attacks, etc. And uh, it feels to me that um, it's, it's of course extremely important to be able to design a proper, resilient, and robust technical system, but it's actually not enough. And uh, as we design those tools, we also need to design a governance structure for those, right? And this can be done both at the technical level. So this means that we need to add new design criteria. And those design criteria need to look at uh, uh, how you can ensure, or how you can make it harder at least, for institutional centralization to happen around a decentralized infrastructure. And of course, this is like this is not possible to just like only by technical tools do that. But you can actually design something that makes it a little bit more difficult, or you can actually try and elaborate some set of protocols or rules, which, even though uh, institutional centralization happens, because anyhow there is this kind of like entropy towards centralization, then it actually perhaps it doesn't matter because the design rules of the architecture are such that even in case of a centralization, then you can still preserve the basic guarantees that this, the technological artifact was meant to do. And so that, that's one layer. And the other, the other aspect is, in addition to this, I think we anyhow, in order to protect anything against institutional centralization, we need probably an institution. Like the technology itself cannot, be, especially at the centralized technology is often much weaker than a centralized one because there is no actual institution that can protect it against co-optation, etc. And so I think that what we need to do at the moment is figure out how we can design distributed governance system, which will like enable to create a decentralized institution to govern a decentralized architecture. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing from you is that we need to help design a, a sort of decentralized uh, governance system and that the way that we can do that is we can build these values in from the beginning so that we don't go back to a centralized system, so that there's, there's ways to make it much more difficult for this to kind of slide out of, out of that control over time, correct? I, I think there's two, like, there two ways to do it. I think these are complementary. One is designing into the architecture itself specific design criteria, specific feature that makes it difficult uh, to re-centralize. And on the other hand is we need to also identify the institutional governance of those architecture, and we need to identify a decentralized way to, to govern them. Great. So, Wendy, you're part of a, you're part of a, a type of standards organization with the W3C. What, what is your view of, of governance, uh, both personally and, and both as part of that organization? Um, well, I, I start out, um, I'm a student of Lawrence Lessig's, and lots of people think of uh, him saying, code is law. Um, in fact, um, he put it into the context of saying there are sort of four forces working together to act as regulators of our activities, code, norms, markets, and law. And uh, I think when we think about governance, 
Uh, it's worth thinking about how all of those forces interact and how pushing or pulling on one of them causes the others to, to move and change in their uh, regulatory force. So while W3C as an open standards organization uh, is working with people who are writing code, uh, computer code, uh, we're also fitting into um, a setting where people are interacting with social norms, interacting with legal institutions, and interacting uh, as market participants. Um, so we have architectural design principles. Um, the HTML working group has uh, written up the, the priority of constituencies, uh, where they say put users, uh, value users over developers, over implementers, over editors. Think first about the, the end users of your technology and of writing standards that will uh, empower and be valuable to uh, the end users of, uh, of the code because there are more of them, they're trying to do more diverse and different things and uh, the possibilities for innovation coming out of those end users are well beyond what even the most clever of uh, standards writers can think of. So leave open those options, those possibilities at the edges uh, and then sort of optimize up the stack, mm -hmm. uh, work to build something that's good for the developers who will be using it to build useful to the implementers and, and useful to, to those producing products because uh, at the end of the day, a, a standard is only as uh, useful as, as it is implemented and uh, out there uh, creating real interoperable uh, and usable and used uh, products. Great, so this, this brings to mind a term that I've, I think I've heard you use, which is socio-technology, correct? Where it's the idea that that social social is part of technology. Like there wouldn't be technology without people because people are helping to reproduce the technology as they choose technology. And sometimes the technology forms how they become social. But having something that's not too set in stone, that's flexible, that allows things to evolve over time. And as you as you said, the edges is, is really important. And with that, I'd like to go to you, Max, about your involvement in the open source community and how those kind of governance models are set there, where that, in a way, is kind of flexible in some respects and, and kind of hard set in, in other things, and, and how you see that working with what you're working on, the DAT project. So I think there's tons of stuff that government and governance in general can learn from open source, and even going very literally, um, I have a great example. I had the extreme privilege of getting to be an early employee at a place called Code for America here in San Francisco. And the job of Code for America, <coughs> when I went into it, was get better government technology um, to be built by people that are primarily technologists. But coming out of it, what I realized, what the actual goal was, was show the government how to hire the best technologists in the field and figure out how to create jobs that people that normally think that they would have to go work at some big tech company to be challenged with engineering problems could see themselves working in our public institutions, which aren't, uh, are a thing that we sort of abandon as the tech industry, um, which I think is a tragedy of the commons. Um, and it's not uh, crazy to think about the government running these decentralized internet infrastructure nodes. Um, I have a really great example, one of the most mind-blowing projects I've seen lately, which is this project called the GDS Registers Team. Um, the GDS is the Government Digital Service in the UK, and they're the most exciting agency in the UK government, in my opinion. Um, we have our own uh, copycat organization in the US called the US Digital Service, and they get people who build you know, Facebook's data centers to take a year off and come and work for the VA or for um, you know, the infrastructure for social security. And they go in there and they say, well, we spent $500 million on this contract, and it's been six years, and it hasn't shipped yet. And if I was in the private sector, I could build this for $50 million. Um, and getting the people, getting us in the room when they're making important decisions about the infrastructure for government, um, th this is what the GDS registers team is doing. They're saying, they actually took a thing that Google uses to revoke certificates in the SSL infrastructure, a cornerstone of the decentralized web, and they figured out if we can use this cryptography to have trusted signed lists of authoritative data sets, then we can have an infrastructure where government agencies can refer with trusted uh, data sets to each other, and then it could be auditable. And it doesn't have to be, um, oh, I lost my emails. There's like actual auditable trails of cryptographically signed information. And so it's like they're doing some of the coolest crypto stuff because what they did was they figured out how they can hire the people in this room, make it appealing to go work in government. So I think in terms of governance, um, let's fix our, fix our existing democracy before we uh, try to build a new one. Interesting. So 
let's say that the existing democracy can't be fixed and we have to deal with it as is, and we always have to deal with it as is. We can make incremental progress. And let's say we do get a bunch of people in this room hired and, and that works out really well. You're a developer, what kind of mistakes have you seen developers make in the past around this type of thing? And, and how would you guide people to do things, uh, learning from, from the past in that way, like from your perspective? Um, whoa, what a question. Um, <laughs> So I have no idea. <laughs> um, I don't know if developers are necessarily a good model for a new system. Um, I think one of the issues that I've seen is that we tend to follow the technology to the limits. And I don't think necessarily the limit of technology is the best thing for society. Um, I think that in general, if technologists uh, had a social mission that they could um, use as their use case, something that if they explain it to a person off the street, um, that person can empathize with what they're working on, um, then maybe we wouldn't push our technology to the limits. Maybe we would push it just far enough. And as Primavera was saying, centralization is a lot of, it's convenient and it's easy. And that says a lot, but decentralization means, you know, free from vendor lock-in and has a lot of these nice properties that we want. So sometimes pushing it all the way to the end of decentralization uh, makes it unadoptable or has has things that people don't necessarily want to support in the public interest. So um, I don't know if I would copy the, uh, the extreme technocracy kind of thing that I see in the developer world. I would rather have developers link themselves to um, like real world social causes. Great. Primavera? I, I would just like to add on this. Um, I, I don't want to answer that question because also I don't know how to answer it. But I think that one thing that I see a lot is that there is this uh, kind of obsession in like a lot of developers, especially like in the in the blockchain space, which is about creating a decentralized technology for the sake of creating a decentralized technology, whereas like decentralization should actually not be not be the objective. It should just be a mean to a different objective, which is like social values or like what what are the values that we actually want to achieve through decentralization. And I think this 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 uh, extreme focus on the decentralized technology itself actually prevent some of the developers to see that actually you can you can have the most beautiful decentralized system in the world but if it's actually not protected against the systematic centralization then actually it's not going to achieve mm -hmm. the original value that you wanted to get yeah i think i think both of you bring up a good point that we have a lot of people that are really excited about making a system with the newest technology and then saying i'm going to scale this thing up and make it really centralized and then do that to the point of doing that and then not want to support it later on because some new other interesting piece of technology comes up. Um, uh, Peter, this, this really interests me because you're dealing with things that last for a really long time. You're having to archive things. You're having to deal with all these different systems and programming languages that aren't going to do well over time and even emulators and computers and things like that that run these different versions of what people have made. What are your biggest pet peeves about this? What are the things that you want built into this next generation system that, um, that will make your life and your job easier? Um, yeah, well, I think uh, Vince Cerf did a really good job this morning of kind of like uh, summarizing like all the various issues and potential solutions to that. And, you know, certainly in the archives and library space, we've been um, spending a good 10, 15 years, you know, analyzing those problems and building solutions. Myself, I've developed an open source digital preservation system. Um, and so, you know, but it keeps coming back to what are the core criteria, what, like, it, it comes back to values, like why are we doing this, right? Archives exist, or archival institutions, we um, collect, uh, you know, we create collections of information objects uh, to provide long-term access to these, to these collections for, you know, for self-knowledge, for collective memory, for protecting freedoms. So certainly just like the Internet Archive, like universal access to information knowledge is our goal. And how do we accomplish that? Well, we, you know, the, the like you said, there's technology obsolescence, there's constantly new technology platforms. We're talking about decentralized web technologies today. What are we going to be talking about 10, 15 years from now? You know, and why are we doing it? So, you know, our, I think if there's one word, it's, you know, we're really concerned about authenticity of information, protecting, you know, what's the truth? Like, and, and we want a record of that truth. And certainly the, the information that's being created today is being created in digital formats. And so, you know, we have certain principles we want to uh, implement so that we can protect the authenticity of information and the long-term accessibility. So peer-to-peer -peer technology, the fact you have multiple copies of information is, is incredibly useful. Um, but if there's only one or two seeds uh, containing that information, that's not useful to us from an archival perspective. So the kind of very practical technical requirements we would lo be looking for in peer-to-peer -peer systems 
is you know, maintaining a min minimum number of copies. But the biggest one is authenticity. So how do we um, protect the context of uh, creation and use uh, the provenance information? There's a lot of hype around uh, proof of existence type solutions for the blockchain solutions right now, which is fantastic. Um, but there's still a big disconnect between that and proof of identity and proving where you know you can I can put an authentic forgery on, on the blockchain, right? But like, how do I trust the information? And that's the kind of stuff that we're concerned about. And we have a lot of you know principles and standards that we think we can contribute to this discussion on the decentralized web and just basically building them into functional requirements. And um, and so maintaining good metadata, multiple copies, those are some very basic things that we as archivists would want to add to the discussion. So so in summary, you need good metadata, you need to be able to uh, maintain multiple copies, uh, you need to have authenticity and make sure that there's a record of that because the one issue that, you know, there could be governments that go in and change the document and nobody knows about that. There could be misinformation, there could be deleted information, there could be marginalized communities that can't preserve this information versus, you know, museum, like large museums that can just say, okay, here's the truth. Here, here we go, it's, it's in this space. So if you had those things built in the system, it would make, make your job a lot easier then? Absolutely, and that's just one of the things that's really exciting me personally about the promise of the centralized web because there is a lot of like kind of postmodern analysis happening within our community right now about you know, the role of memory institutions that they have as institutions and kind of, you know, uh, you know as the kind of de facto uh, de providers of the truth where obviously there's lots of marginalized communities that see that differently and including the way we run it, the policies and procedures and tools we have. So decentralized technologies allow marginalized communities, any community, to kind of take ownership of their own archival collections and the technology's there, the tools are there. Um, and you know we have best practices to offer to that discussion because we're not in the this you know as archivists are we have you know we, we subscribe to this idea of providing authentic access to authentic information and whether that's doing it in an institutional setting or by giving uh, you know sharing our knowledge on how to make systems achieve that better in, in particular in decentralized systems that's something that we want to be part of.